Hello and welcome to the Menfulness Podcast. Thank you for joining us. I hope you're doing well. I can see my breath in this room currently. Uh, I'm refusing to put the heating on if it's just me in the house. How are you doing? I hope you're managing out there. It's December, but we recognise that it's not a Merry Christmas for everyone. Uh, so if you're struggling with isolation, loneliness, mental health, whatever it might be, we're here for you. Uh, send us an email, join the private Facebook group, get involved. We're in this together. Before we start, we wanted to give you a bit of news. Uh, a big thank you to First York for choosing Menfulness as their Christmas campaign. Our text to give campaign is currently on all the buses and they're talking about us throughout December on their social media. So have a look at what they've got to say and uh, give them a like and a share. If you want to help us raise money for our cause, then please go to our website, menfulness.org, and click donate at the top of any page. Now for a little bit of feedback from the last episode with Frankie. You were amazing and inspiring. I both laughed and cried throughout. I admire your strength for speaking out. Congratulations. I feel like it will help a lot of people. I definitely took a lot from it. You are truly an amazing human. Thank you so much for this. I couldn't agree more. I was totally blown away by how well Frankie knew how to be honest about such a personal and difficult time of his life. It was definitely a very special conversation. So if you haven't listened to it yet, then do go back after this episode and check it out. But for now, stick around for another conversation in a similar vein, this time with Nick Sinclair. It's another big chat with big subject matter for you today. Nick is a public health professional. He's a qualified counsellor, which he does voluntarily in his spare time. He's also one of the stars of a new film which raises awareness of suicide called Why. Nick has a really calming voice and speaks with the sort of clarity and wisdom which seems to me to be more prevalent among those who have been to a dark place. We're lucky he's given us his time and his experience. We talk a lot about suicide, we talk alcohol, social media, counselling, We cover a lot of ground, but it's quite heavy at times, so do look after yourselves and make sure you're in the right headspace for it before you carry on. Remember, mindfulness has all sorts of opportunities where you can safely share what you're going through, and that's enough for some people. We've got access to counselling, if it might be of help to you, or a bloke that you know who might be struggling right now. But if you're feeling suicidal, first of all, remember it is not something to be ashamed of. One in five of us are going to feel that way at some point in our lives. If you need to speak to someone about it, then the Samaritans are available 24-7 on 116123. Or if you're in an emergency, then call 999. You are of value. People want to help. Please, please reach out. Finally, I'm planning a special podcast with all the Menfulness trustees. The five guys who run this charity will be answering your questions. So I really need to know, what do you want to know? You can comment them here, depending on where you're finding this podcast, or email them to yorkmenfulness at gmail.com. They can be about our charity, what we do here, why we do it. They can be silly, serious, emotional, whatever you want to know. We will put those questions to the boys, so get in touch. Right now, though, here's Nick Sinclair. Welcome, Nick. Thank Hi, you. Sam. Thank you for being here. Hi, oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks yeah. for the invite. Oh, and, absolutely, uh, man. We've... The, the man cave is living <laughs> up to expectation. <laughs> I'm loving it. I love it. I feel like everyone feels like they've got to say that now because everyone else has said it before them. I... <laughs> Someone's going to walk in and go, oh, is this it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got to build it up a bit. <laughs> um, uh, how are you feeling today? Are you good? I'm all right, actually, yeah. I had a, a decent day at, at work and had um, uh, a screening of the film about suicide prevention that um we uh made with the york end in stigma project and yeah. that went really well oh that's really good yeah that's i'm excited to get into that because that's kind of how we've reconnected a little bit because we we first met and knew each other from the council from our council days i'm still there uh but we 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 got talking kind of over that project it was time to talk for a while wasn't it is it time to talk yeah time, time to change time to time to talk yeah um uh, well, time, or was it time to change? Oh, I'm, <laughs> Got you now, it? Me now. I think the national project was time to change. No, it was. T- it, was t- it was time to talk. It's definitely time to talk. <laughs> I'm sure of it now. But um, 
it, 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 I think it had some branding that was time to change as well. Yeah. Or maybe. But yeah, that's how it started anyway. Yeah. The, na- the name's not important. Yeah. Well, it's changed since, hasn't it? Because they've yeah. now kind of rebranded it as uh, the, yes, York Ending Stigma. Yeah. So it was, it used to be a nationally funded um, social movement to challenge stigma and discrimination uh, uh, against mental health. And I helped set up the, the York um, project um probably five six years ago yeah we applied for some national funding um we didn't get it uh unfortunately but um we uh we kind of managed to get some of the budget from um public health uh grant and use that to to set the project up um it was to have a coordinator to try and engage people with lived experience who wanted to kind of do some work to share their lived experience break down those barriers talk about mental health have to have kind of normalized conversations about mental health and well-being and people's experiences um and then i think after a few years the the national project funding ended um but york committed to continuing to fund the local project um and because couldn't it be attached to the the national project branding it was rebranded as york ending stigma which right. is a nice acronym of yes yeah it's really good isn't it and the, the so far they seem to be going strong so that's been a few years has it that you guys have been york ending stigma yeah it's been um Oh, it, it, time's gone weird with <laughs> all the COVID stuff. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I, was it pre-COVID, during COVID, post-COVID? It was sort of around that time, I think, that COVID was, was just happening. So what's that, two, three years yeah. maybe? Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, that that was when it was rebranded. And it's gone from strength to strength, really. So there's, there's a whole number of um, sort of champions and, you know, really active champions and lots of social media activity lots of programs so the so the suicide prevention work is like one bit of it then there's the the kind of the more general you know um challenging stigma work so people will you know share their stories be present at events talk to people um you know challenge some of those myths and 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 kind of perceptions that people might have about people who struggle with mental ill health um and then there's also a workplace um theme as well and they've just released um a a toolkit for employers which i think is really good because it it's it's a very practical easy to use thing and um it just allows you to look at what your organization does throughout the whole kind of process of of having an employee so you know from recruitment to you know somebody going into retirement really and and it looks at what's working well what could be improved what's working really efficiently and and you can kind of self-assess um your organization against those criteria you know with that focus of trying to challenge stigma around mental health so encouraging people to talk about mental health at work so you know rather than hiding it because a lot of people hide their mental health at work i mean i know i've done that yeah quite a lot in the past and you know when you i think i've i've had points where i actually i could not cope with going to work like years ago and and rather than be able to feel honest about it it was a uh, you know oh i feel ill i've got the flu i've got a stomach bug and things like yeah. that and i think that's that's quite common yeah really um but it doesn't really get talked about and if you don't feel supported or safe to be open about that then i think you hide it because you're worried about what the what the impact of that might be absolutely we've we've got blokes who who say have told us that they won't talk about it to to their work it, they're mm. conscious about um you know opportunities and progression and promotions if if they disclose that they're you know unwell we've also had people who've had sort of um later diagnoses uh and, and expected that that might help them with support from the workplace and actually it's it's worked in the opposite way and they've actually you know um s- struggled more um after having their diagnosis and stuff so it does feel um like there's still quite a lot of that stigma out there i mean i know i can tell that the conversation is you know um getting easier generally um around mental health but there's still these pockets of of real stigma isn't there oh yeah completely i think yeah i mean the conversation about mental health is more present i think than it than it has been well i mean 
certainly from what I can remember, yeah. um, you, you know, it's more able to be talked about. People are a lot more aware of it. But I think it's also masked a lot. You know, there's there's a lot of awareness about mental health problems, but it doesn't mean people are necessarily talking about it in the right way or no. the most supportive way or understanding what it might be like for somebody and having a bit of empathy um, around that. Yeah, we've d I've t spoken about that to a few people. It's quite hard if you have never experienced something. I, I was there myself until I'd experienced not being able to cope myself. I'd never really thought of myself as having mental health, N not a mental health challenge, just I'd never thought about my mental health really. I'd coped, I'd had coping mechanisms. I, you know, probably used alcohol to mask my anxiety. I used you know, um, reassurance behaviours and, and, and just seeking validation and, and all the sort of stuff that an anxious person might do, but not realise that that's what I was doing until I'd got to beyond coping. And then it was like, oh, God, yeah, this has actually been me for quite a long time. So so I suppose opening the conversation and letting people um, normalise in that conversation, both in and out of the workplace, that's, you know, that, that's going to be a benefit to us all. And yet that's what YES um, is focused on across York, um, in and out of the workplace. And you essentially helped sort of start that thing off, but have moved on um, from the council since, um, yet still quite heavily involved in the project. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I mean, when I, when, when I helped set it up, I was working for the council um, and I... I'd kind of I'd said to you know the other champions that I've got my own lived experience but I wasn't ready to be active as a champion at that point and I and I I think actually a lot of that was connected to that worry about stigma yeah you know and I didn't want to it was about it was a kind of a boundary thing as well I didn't want to be the commissioner of that service and also be you know a visible active champion which yeah did, <laughs> I'm kind of torn with that really because part of the part of the message around this is is normalization of it and you know we talk about mental health and well-being and making sure that we get you know the voice of somebody with lived experience and forget actually that a lot of people that work in mental health health care social care well a lot of people in society generally yeah. also have their own mental health struggles so we're already yeah. excluding members of staff from being able to say actually i i've got my own lived experience too my role in this is a member of staff you know yeah. supporting it as a commissioner or whatever but I've also got my own lived experience and I can understand it. And I think it's very difficult for people in that employment yeah. field to be able to say that because they worry about whether they'll be judged as competent because, yeah. you know, they've admitted that they, they struggle with mental ill health. And I guess I had all those thought processes. Oh, oh I don't want to say that. I don't want to come across yeah. as weak. I don't want people to judge me. I don't want people to sit there and think, oh, well, that's why he's such a dick. <laughs> and, and things like that um no one thinks that about you nick <laughs> maybe well maybe not in my head sometimes right. that's yeah. what i think people think and that yeah. i i guess that's that whole sort of self stigma stuff yeah um but yeah it, it, it so so when i left um i i i felt able to to, to kind of get on board with with being a champion and this project came up to to make a film focused on suicide prevention um about that time and it was it was kind of perfect timing really and I thought yeah okay that's that's something that I want to be able to do I want to be able to kind of share a bit of the story and I guess people listening who don't really have much understanding about you know what it's like to have suicidal thoughts or haven't really you know it hasn't entered their 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 lives at all I mean you know I, I'm, I'm glad that it hasn't but also the film itself isn't doom and gloom and it's not uh, you know it, it it's a it's an honest, open, yeah. um, but I, uh, film. But it's also quite inspiring, and yeah. it's also practical, and it's helpful. And I think it's that. That's what we're aiming for. It's got to be useful to people. It's got to be something that can help prevent suicide. Yeah. Um, either from supporting somebody who's going through their own problems and helping them realise that you know there are practical things that they can do yeah. to 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 kind of get through that difficult time or to kind of help people who are trying to support somebody who's experiencing depression or suicidal thoughts or, you know, they're worried about, to help them have a conversation with them better. Yeah, absolutely. I got lucky enough to see it um, at St John Uni um, on, a, on a big screen in a, you know, in a proper lecture hall. 
um, and witness the Q and A. Q, Q and A afterwards. Got my vowels mixed up there. Uh, the Q and A afterwards, and um, I was just I I didn't know what to expect because it is such a personal and um, just yeah uh, difficult subject, and there's so much stigma around it that when someone says we've done this film with um, I can't quite remember how they worded. Um, the sort of six of you that that bear your souls in it, um, and so you, you you go with all of the. Is it going to be really sad? Is it going to be difficult? You pep you pep yourself up for something really really difficult to watch, and it's not that. It's um it's hopeful and it, it's inspiring and and like you say, I mean, shout out to Kev uh, Curran and Scott Acos from Inspired Youth who who've helped put the film together because they've. They've really put your stories front and centre, but made it so accessible for people to kind of relate to it. And even if we don't know people who have attempted suicide, we we probably know people who have felt suicidal at some point, if we haven't ourselves. And so it does affect everyone. It's not a niche subject. It's something that we should all be talking about. And I think what you what you've all done with that project is is really special um I, I hope everyone gets to see it i think everyone should see it. It, it you know it should be it should be standard for people to be having those conversations but i can imagine it must have taken so much to to agree to it and to 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 figure out how to put it into words like how does that how does all that happen oh thanks sam i i'm i'm really glad that you you know you got a lot out of watching it and it was lovely to see you at the the screening as well because we well, hadn't, I didn't know we hadn't be seen in each it. other i know, I know. <laughs> we hadn't seen each other for ages and it was like oh it's sam yeah and uh, yeah it was really cool to see you there and uh you know, we had a quick chat and a catch up and and you know and then agreed this chat about yeah. this and it was it was lovely um and yeah the i mean the whole process of making the the film was um quite lengthy i think i think we're we're over a year in into it now and yeah we had a lot of preparation we had a lot of thought about what messages do we want to give how do we how do we want to come across what do we want to be the focus of it and we did lots of kind of group discussions about okay what are the themes with our own stories what are we prepared to share what are we not prepared to share um and i mean it's it's a film we did you know um a few sessions of recording with uh with kev and and, and scott and and then he was obviously edited it um, to include content, so it so it flows as a yeah. film. And he's done he's done a great job in that process of, of directing it. But of course, it doesn't. It's not the whole story for all of us. It's kind of snapshots of of, yeah. of what we talked about. And so you know, we're thinking about well, what can we do as follow up? You know, can we expand on some of the content, some of the some of the stories that we shared? Um, also, we, you know, we we're thinking about how to make it available and accessible and what that needs to look like to do it in a safe way as well. Yeah. Cuz you know, I appreciate what you're saying about the fact that it is kind of hopeful and helpful and inspiring and I think, you know, that that is a lot of the feedback we've had, but it is also a difficult topic. Yeah. And so, you know, it needs to be talked about sensitively and I think that's <laughs> it's it's kind of like a double-edged sword in a way with that because we're trying to encourage people to to open up and talk yeah. about it but acknowledge that it's difficult to talk about yes. um whilst at the same time saying you know there are i think one of the key messages from the film is you know don't worry about having to say the right words to somebody because yeah. if you care and you're trying to help and you're you're able to demonstrate empathy that comes across and i'd rather somebody was blundering through a conversation and yeah. i knew they cared yeah. and trying to listen and yeah. trying to understand what you know what it's like for me because just the fact that somebody takes time to listen you know i think it's massively underestimated it's so so helpful at times yeah. to just have that because you feel valued you feel yeah. listened to and that i think can be just really powerful so yeah it's not about worrying that you you know you've got to say the right things you've got to say certain things it's 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 i suppose helping people to just feel a bit more confident to be able to have that difficult conversation if yeah. they need to yeah and then realize that actually like you say put, putting your foot in it is not 
the end it's not the end of the conversation it doesn't have to be the end of the conversation you can learn by putting your foot in it what the right thing to say is and it, it just i mean jack was saying you know that that one thing that he goes by now is even if you don't have something to say say i don't know what to say even that's better than not saying anything um yeah, a hundred percent. Because if you, if you just think, if you say something to somebody and they don't know what to say and they just look at you blankly, yeah. what goes on in your mind is yeah. that I've said the worst thing ever and yeah. now this person hates me or yeah. they just want to run away. And they might want to run away because it's yeah. a difficult conversation. Yeah. But do you know what? I'd rather somebody was honest about that and just say, look, I, I really sorry that you're going through that. Yeah. I've got my own stuff at the minute and I can't deal with this right now. Yeah, you'd understand that. Yeah. You'd understand that. I, I mean, I think that there was quite a bit in the um, suicide prevention training about like myths around where people sort of feel like if someone says something that's, that indicates they could be having suicidal thoughts, that most people rush to say something cheerful, try and take their mind off it, say something to cheer them up, avoid by, like, as much as you can talking about suicide. And as though you mentioning it is going to make them feel worse about the feeling that they're going through and that and that actually that's the opposite actually it's totally totally yeah. the opposite i mean asking somebody directly is is actually one of the you know the key things you can do if you're really worried about some yeah. somebody and i mean I, I don't i don't mean just just walking up to somebody and, and asking them directly yeah. and bluntly yeah. you, you can work up to it but if you ask around it then somebody who's feeling that way can evade it yeah uh, but if you ask directly and you you know you you do it in the right way and you kind of time it right yeah then somebody somebody might be uh, feel able to open up and and actually that might be the first time that they've ever said to anybody yeah. that's how i feel and just being able to do that and say that out loud that's how you feel that that can just take the pressure away from it and take some of the power away from yeah. it so that it, it becomes less likely to actually happen because yeah. somebody's now aware of it and you yeah. can think about okay so you feel like that and that's you know that's a really difficult feeling to have yeah how can we keep you safe yeah and and it doesn't really need to be any more complicated than that no then you're not expected to sort of resolve someone's situation more just help share that moment with them and, and know that they're in a safe place and that's we've learned that through mentalness is that people do want to talk um men do want to talk but they need that safe environment. They need to feel like the that the conversation is confidential. That they're not going to be judged. That they're that that maybe that you've been through some stuff yourself. That there's just that kind of um, non-judgment, um, kind, warm space that you just feel comfortable in. And it's not easy to create um, straight away. It does, like you say, you maybe do need a, a conversation first. I find it easier if you share what you've been through a little bit people tend to be a bit more open to sharing with you. I mean, do you find being so upfront and honest about what you've been through, do you find that people want to share with you and come to you with, with what they've been through? I know I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 That's a hard question, actually. I think so. Um, it, it, it's difficult to know, really. I mean, I, I was thinking about this earlier because I was, you know, trying to prepare for this yeah. for this podcast and 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 worrying about over preparing and under preparing and yeah. thinking oh I, you know I want to make sure I say this oh and god I know that feeling but then what's Sam <laughs> going to ask me and will <laughs> and, then, and will we have enough time and will I yeah. just never stop waffling and hey, there's will I no say... time limits here we could turn it to a three part if we need to but don't you worry about that um but yeah the um I think I think being being able to be open and honest with somebody and show a bit of vulnerability and demonstrate that you've kind of got some understanding and empathy. I think, I think that inevitably helps somebody feel a bit more comfortable. And I think what you said about, you know, men wanting to talk absolutely 100%. Like men are not like Neanderthal beasts who just want to go and like hunt wild animals and eat raw meat <laughs> yeah you know we we we, we there is mo a lot more to us th yeah. than that and um i think that sort of myth of you know men don't talk and men don't ask for help it is it, again i think that's you know there's, there's complexity to that yeah because like you say the environment has to be right and you know you have to feel comfortable and confident that you know what what you say is going to be taken seriously and not just dismissed yeah um and you know given a bit of respect 
for, yeah. for, for you know for, for 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 what's said um and and i think you know it's it's really um helpful to have spaces like mindfulness that you know can create that safety yeah. and 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 just and and have that normal conversation and i'm not quite explaining it the way the no, no, to, I, this is no, no. I think this is this is great. I mean, you've you have experienced um, mindfulness a little bit. You came to the retro gaming night. Um, I did. I got knocked out of Mario Kart in the first <laughs> round. <laughs> yeah, me too. Got it. You came after um, at the night after we'd seen you, um, and and you know, I just sort of said, "Would you fancy the retro gaming night um, tomorrow night?" And and you you came, and I was really chuffed to see you. Um, and it, it was quite busy. It was quite, it's, you know, it is a it is a sort of. It's not sort of blokes sat around having really difficult conversations with each other, like perhaps our mindfulness at night's talking sessions, our monthly sessions sort of sat around. That's a bit more extreme. Um, people just tend to have general conversation, but know that they can. The permission is there if you need to, to kind of go that little bit further and talk that little bit more realistic, you know, real, real about what's going on. Um because often in a pub environment, you kind of feel like there's a limit to how far down the iceberg you can go with these conversations, don't you? You might say, oh, I'm having a few problems at home or whatever. Anyway, do you want another beer or, you know, what score is it or whatever it might be? You can imagine those conversations have kind of a, a limit. Um, and it's quite liberating to know that there isn't really a limit. There still maybe is a limit in that environment where there's lots of people around. Um, you maybe don't feel quite as... Um, private but it's a re it's just a really good feeling to know that you can talk to each other yeah I, I definitely felt that you know when i first met you this was before mindfulness and this was before you'd become a champion i think um you were certainly running the time to change but i just we'd just go for lunch and and chat about what we actually had going on and it felt really kind of um yeah just like nice to talk about what was actually going on yeah, it was. It was nice. And it was, yeah, it was lovely to go and have, you know, lunch and sit by the river and eat yeah. eat sandwiches and spill my sandwiches all over the floor <laughs> and get attacked by the geese. Yeah, the that geese was, after <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, it, I think you're right. I think being able to know that you, you know, you can talk about something that's a bit difficult, you know, you don't have to be pretending that you're happy all yeah. the time you don't have to be pretending everything's perfect it's okay to sometimes say you know actually i'm struggling a bit or this has happened and you know it doesn't it doesn't need to be anything more than that sometimes it doesn't mean that you you know you, you automatically now need to go to the doctors and get you know yeah. antidepressants or you're going to be referred into you know a clinical psychologist or be you know put in a in a psychiatric ward or or, or kind of have a very medicalized response yeah. a, a conversation and just being able to, to talk and get stuff off your chest is really helpful do you think that sometimes also holds people back then the idea that kind of once it's out it, it takes on a, a a more serious life of its own that you can't kind of t you can't take it back once it's out sort of thing i, gu I guess so i mean i think it's probably different for ev for yeah. everyone i mean i, I it's hard for me to know what it would be like for somebody who's kind of never really experienced any problems with 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 yeah. mental health because of I, for me i think it's it's been something that's been there since i was a teenager really in terms right. of feeling depressed yeah. having anxiety having sort of really low self worth and and self esteem and and just kind of struggling with that and one of the ways that i've found helpful throughout my life is to be able to talk to people about that and I've been lucky enough at times to have you know friends or groups of friends who are prepared to listen and, and help out but I know not everybody's had that experience and so I guess it might feel quite daunting as if yeah. I say this what does that mean does that yeah. now mean that I've got a mental health problem or will people judge me or they think I'm weak you know will, w what will happen and I can absolutely understand that because I mean, I felt like that at times as well. I used to think, well, I don't want to, don't want to show vulnerability because, you know, that might change people's opinion of me. They might think yeah. that now, you know, they don't see me in the same light. They don't see me as worthy of being yeah. able to do my job, or you know, they might, I don't know, change their behaviours towards me yeah. or something like that. And it's, it, it, it can, it can take on a whole world in your mind yeah. about, you know, possible impacts.
I, I suppose as well, like when I was at my most sort of anxious, um, that was when I could least find the right words to articulate it anyway. And that was when I kind of had decided that I probably was going to have to abandon my friendships and because I, I wouldn't be able to spend time with them and I wouldn't really be able to tell them why because there was no real rational reason for it. And so it's not, for me, I'm lucky that I feel like that was a, 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 a part of my life that largely I've been able to move past because of, of, of being able to manage the situation and understand that it was situational rather than sort of generalised. Um, and, and I'm able to talk about it much more now because I feel like I've passed that part of my life. And actually, the idea that people find the strength to be able to talk and articulate while they're in the middle of something like that is it blows my mind. You know, how did you learn to find the right words for what you were going through? Can you remember? Um, you were a teenager, you said, when, when this sort of started to... Yeah, I, d I don't think I did find the right words, not for a long time. I used to... Um I mean, I'd, I'd talk around it. I'd talk around... I don't think I'd talked directly about how I felt um, yeah. necessarily because I don't think I fully understood it. I just I just remember, you know, not just feeling unhappy, feeling depressed, worrying about everything. You know, I, I had... Um, I mean, I, I'm from... London originally I'm I, I see myself as an honorary northerner now even though I don't sound like it but <laughs> but I do I've, I think I've been up in up north more than now for longer than I than I than I lived um down south whereabouts was that we didn't do any background of you no at all. we didn't <laughs> did we actually um uh, Tottenham uh right. originally and then um I when yeah when I moved out I went to university in the Midlands and then I kind of lived a few other places I kind of moved down to Exeter and then up so I lived in Aberdeen for a bit and then Newcastle and now yeah. York oh so I've way. kind of gone all the way up and yeah. on my way back down but <laughs> yeah. I think I think I might stop here I'm not sure yeah. um but yeah so I um I had um yeah I I mean I had a, a difficult time um in my teenage years I, I had a difficult time at school I didn't particularly feel like I fitted in I was felt there was kind of something odd I didn't quite I wasn't good in groups I wasn't good at, at, at kind of being I wasn't good at being popular basically I don't think I mean I had like a few friends but mostly they were like outside school and then when I got a little bit older I just sort of gave up on school a bit really and I, I well I had a, <laughs> I had a good excuse in one regard because it was just coming up to GCSE times and I've I'd kind of just grown my hair long because I was I was into like rock music and stuff and I thought I was like yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah but, but, and um and um and the, I think the, the headmaster just said you've got to cut your hair or don't come back to school so <gasps> like, all right well I won't come back then so I didn't, and it was only a few weeks before the exams and stuff. So it was like it's kind of almost study leave anyway. Right. So I was like, oh, wait, it doesn't matter. And yeah. I had no plans of going back to do A levels. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was like, I just, I'd, ha I'd I didn't want to do school. I was like, I hated it, yeah. and I just didn't feel like I was getting anything from it. I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I started applying for jobs. I got offered another job. I got offered a job actually. And again, I, I they said, you have to cut your hair. I was like, well, I don't want to. <laughs> and uh, Which is ironic now because I'm absolutely bald. And I sort of went bald at about 21. I started going bald. But I think I had to you make... Get the, that long uh, hair for as long I as I had to could. make the most of it. Yeah, while, <laughs> while I had it. Um, and uh, yeah. And anyway, so after that, I thought, okay, well, I, I can't, you know, I can't, not do anything I you know I got I got into a college I I did A levels there I felt that was a much better fit for me mm -hmm. um I, I got sort of part-time jobs in the evening I was doing um tele sales for double glazing in the evenings and going to college wow. and um yeah for for a few years and um did my A levels sort of just about scraped through enough to get into you know university yeah um and, and I which did, uni was it uh Wolverhampton right yeah and that's you studied public health at that point. Did you know that's what you wanted to do, or no, no, I didn't. I did um, psychology, right? Because I think I was just I was kind of fascinated with mental health at that point. I was like, I I wanted to understand more about me and yeah. my mind and how it worked and kind of, you know, how to how to make sense of the world because I just 
I just didn't feel like I I got it, and I and I kind of I did the course, and I was, you know, and I, I'd I'd kind of got into coping by drinking too much, and and just you know, and that continued through university, which I guess is quite a normal experience for people. But yeah. it, it, if I look back on it, I think it was it was the start of it becoming quite a you know a, yeah. a, a bit of a co- you know more of a coping mechanism than maybe just to go out and have fun yeah. because it was it was a, yeah it was just a bit a bit much i think but I, I th- and everybody else is doing that and so it's probably hard to know where that line is yeah absolutely but if i yeah i think it was it was something that became definitely a crutch for me yeah um, and I, you know, I did, I did all right. I, I, I got my degree. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. You know, I struggled with mental health problems through, through that time. You know, I think, um, I don't think people really knew loads about it. Um, they knew, you know, that I'd experienced problems, I think, but, they, but they were because of situational things. So yeah. like, I'd I'd had a girlfriend that was um, kind of sort of from the Midlands area and and we both ended up in the same university, lived together and then that kind of didn't work out because why would it, we were far too young and just, you know, and it was all uh, odd. So so that that sort of, I think, friends associated me with, you know, feeling down because of that situation. And that sort of continued like throughout my 20s I mean I left university I didn't I didn't know what I wanted to do no. I mean I I knew that I wasn't ready to do anything working in mental health so I'd, I'd had an idea of like becoming a counsellor um but I realized you know I, I was nowhere near ready that I, I I had so much of my other stuff to sort out and the first time I accessed any kind of form of support was through student support services and had had a brief set of counseling there right. i honestly can't remember much about it because i don't think i was in the right place for it and I, i've had various forms of counseling over the years that gradually allowed me to kind of understand a bit more about what's going on for me yeah um and and finding the right form of counseling when you're in the right place and understanding what you want to get from it is is kind of massively important it doesn't that's, that's it, interesting it, You've got always work different the first types, time. yeah. I didn't mean I didn't realise that there's that there's different types. I mean, I saw your um, title, and we'll, we'll come to that if that's all right. But yeah, that that idea that actually, if you don't, the counsellor doesn't work for you. That doesn't mean that counselling doesn't work for you. It means that what the relationship or the type, or even you sort of mentioned that the, the time wasn't right for you. There can be a right time for it. Yeah, absolutely. I think and and expectations are important. Um, but yeah, the timing is important, and the ability to, to, you know, to get the most out of counselling. I mean, it's, it's 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 most helpful when you know you can actually open up fully and explore some of the things in an honest way and be quite vulnerable with it because, you know, it's it, it you know it's usually one you know a, a fifty minute appointment every week and it's quite intensive for people and yeah. you know it, it it's not. You know, it's not that the counsellor fixes the individual. It's just that the individual going for counselling is prepared to put in the effort to 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 figure out what's going on for them and and yeah. and work out how they can kind of feel better, more confident, more you know happier, get through some difficult times. And the real work comes from that person in the other however many other hours there are in a week minus Between one. Between sessions, yeah, right, yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, we we talk a lot to blokes about kind of finding the words, and I think I can imagine that that's quite a barrier. It's been a barrier for me to counselling. Is I don't quite know where I'd start or what I'd say, um, and and I think getting past that, finding a network, finding the right people that you, so it's not all bouncing around in your head, and you can practice saying it and getting it wrong without kind of upsetting anybody or you know you know sometimes just getting it out of your head so it's not in in there making no sense um i can imagine counseling is really good for that yeah once once something's out of your head you know if it's written down if it's said out loud if it's 
spoken to somebody else, it changes it. Yeah. If it's all it, or if it, all it does is float around inside your own head, inside your own thought processes, with only you to like yeah. pick it apart and, you and interpret it, holes you loops, just go around you? in circles, and it yeah. and it doesn't change it. But talking yeah. about it and and opening up about it, it it can help change your perspective on it, and that's probably you know one of the biggest things in in terms of working through a problem is is looking at it from a different perspective and and appreciating i think you know the things that are positive from it and you know or or, or you know looking at it from a different angle changes your appreciation of a situation and you can realize that you know you've got tools and skills and ability to to kind of change how you think about it change how you respond to it and to kind of work through it and it's also not something that happens overnight you know it it takes a bit of time so you've got to have realistic expectations of what you can get from from counseling yeah um so yeah thank you so you you're still in wolverhampton you've sat you've tried counseling you've been through a breakup and you complete your degree you pass your degree i mean to be able to still do that with the struggles that it sounds like you already had sounds like a lot. Um, what then, how did you then move on? How did you get here? What happened in between? <laughs> what brought you to York? Oh, okay. So, um, I mean, I didn't use my degree for a long time. I, 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 I had a range of different jobs and, you know, I, they would, you know, it was just jobs. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I ended up um, working in a, in a, call center and I ended up sort of being a, a, a manager in the call center and then you know doing some recruitment stuff and then I got made redundant um and I I kind of I, I just didn't have a clue what to do because I'd got really comfortable where I was it was you know it was familiar it wasn't what I wanted to do but it yeah. was kind of it was kind of good enough and then and then I thought you know what I'll 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 apply for like a one of these graduate training schemes and I was a bit older than than other people doing it because I'd had a few years of work experience but I did that Is it still in Wolverhampton? No no this was oh this was back in London but I'd I'd kind of lived in Exeter in between that and and had yeah various jobs I moved yeah. around a lot because yeah. I was I just didn't have a clue what I wanted to do to figure it out Yeah exactly and I, and I didn't do a very good job of figuring it out but um, I've got there in the end, yeah. or, or almost. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I applied for that and started working for the NHS. And um, then I think um, the, the, yeah, I mean, that, that, that basically that opened up a lot of doors for me because that allowed me to kind of get into a field of work that was a lot closer to where my interests were and where my degree was. And, and I, I kind of gradually built up my, um, experience and my qualifications right. since then. And, and, you know, I've, I, I now work in, in public health and I've got, you know, a, a couple of, uh, master's qualifications that I've done while working. Um, and I've, I've also, um, qualified as a counsellor now so I finally got to where I thought I wanted to be when I went to university it took me well 20 years later <laughs> I think um but I finally got there so I did I you know I did that training course I completed that um you know that wasn't that wasn't easy for me and that came with some challenges um I had to I had to take a year gap doing that course because I had a whole load of personal stuff happen um this is the, so this is the counseling course this is the counseling so course so you were all, yeah. you'd already done your your senior uh, you was you've already in public health you've done your master's degrees and what have you and then you still chose to do more qualifying as a counselor on top of all that then yeah yeah when you put it <laughs> when you put it like that Sam it, it's <laughs> yeah it's it's I mean, it's amazing mate it's amazing and uh, what a, what a distance you've come both physically and um from a you know from a career point of view so you're you're very good at doing this you're very good at picking out the uh the positives see I, well, I, it's, it feels like it's this you know this path you see the japanese call it ikigai and um, everybody's got an ikigai uh you know in japanese culture. i've not heard of that phrase so ikigai is if you imagine four circles um overlapping each other one is the something that you love the next is something that you're good at 
the next is something that you can be paid for, and then the next is something that the world needs. And where they all overlap in the middle is ikigai. And we don't have a word for it. We have a word, vocation we, is the nearest thing we can get to it. But the idea being that we all have kind of like a a place where what we can do and what we should be doing and what we can be paid for kind of conf- there's a confluence and that's where we should all be kind of heading for. And it feels like your path is is kind of is leading you there if it hasn't led you there already. And it sounds you sounds like you've got like you with your volunteer work on top of what you do with the um, with your your actual job. Sounds like you you're getting there, mate. That's that's exciting. I I really like Icky Guy. Yeah. I think that's good, that's so cool. Yeah. And I was trying to remember what the phrase for those um it's a Venn diagram, Venn diagram isn't it? that's yeah. it. I couldn't remember what it was yeah, called. It's Venn, yeah. you're right. Yeah. Icky Guy is just better <laughs> and very, very precise. Yeah. And yeah, I like that. The four circles where they all can join. That's where you that's where you want to aim to be, really. Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily matter how long it takes you to get there, I don't think. I think the idea being is that you're on that path and um and so, yeah, so I cut you off there. You were talking about, you did your counselling qualification um, and you took some time out to do to, to complete that because of what else you had going on. Yeah, I just, I had a whole load of s- stuff happen all at once uh, and it just, it just overwhelmed me. I, I, I had, um, uh, I had bereavements. I had kind of um, some difficulties with like um, friendship groups. Um, I, had um other stuff going on i i don't really want to go into no, that's the, the, fine. the yeah, details of, of, of what happened but um yeah it, it was basically multiple things that all happened at once yeah. and i just i made a decision to take a break from the counseling course and then and then a week later broke my ankle i was like okay well that that reinforces that i made the right oh, decision man. because if i would have tried to carry on with all of that other stuff the mental stuff and uh the the physical stuff at the same time i wouldn't have coped no. and i think i think um yeah the, the the breaking my ankle was 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 actually it was it was literally like the straw that broke the camel's back i was like okay that that's it i just need i need a break and i got I, you know i had to be at home because i had to stay at home with my leg up for oh, six God. weeks oh, and um, you know walk around the house on crutches with a rucksack taking things from room to room um oh, uh, but yeah it, it healed and um i got back on uh roller skates after after breaking it and and kind of made sure that I wasn't fearful of yeah. of, of doing that, so it didn't let me stop. It's like getting back on the horse. Yeah, yeah exactly. I thought yeah. you know I'm not going to let it um, stop me from doing that. I'm not going to let it become like a fear. Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, I I I did that, and and that was good because that was kind of, you know, that's that's a hobby for me that I really enjoyed, and um, I still do, but I don't I don't skate as as much as I used to. Um, we had Pete Quinn on just just last time talking about the same sport. It's uh, I know it's more popular than I realised it is. I was surprised at that, and <laughs> and and I think um, I, I remember because Pete came to 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 the film screening, and um, as he as he was walking out, he said, "Oh, I'm I'm glad to see you uh, using the right the right skates, the quad <laughs> skates." And I was like, "Yeah, I know, but they're they're, they're the old the old school ones." But uh, yeah, my, I I had I listened to Pete's podcast, and he said he, he sometimes goes to skate around Roundtree Park, and I I do as well actually, but I haven't I haven't for a long time. Oh, I just love but, the idea of you two just happening upon each other both on skates. Well, I, I was I was thinking that maybe we should sort out with Pete and we go for we we'll go for a skate together. But yeah, no, I used to I used to do it. Uh, uh, skate with um, uh, do roller derby oh, so yeah. it was all kind of an indoor kind of contact sport and uh, so it was more more there than than kind of outdoor skating but yeah. I did um, I, <laughs> I did uh, do outdoor skating um, from time to time I think I remember I skated to the um, the New Earswick Hall for a, like a, a tattoo convention or something oh, yes. that was there and I, and I got there and I uh, I put my skates in the ru- in in my backpack and then realised oh I've not brought any shoes <laughs> I'm not wearing any not wearing any trainers so I had to walk around for the rest of the day in my socks I would have skated around for the rest of that day <laughs> oh you couldn't you couldn't in the floor that you couldn't in there it was it was too you know, the floor wasn't right <laughs> no that's cool man that's cool um and and yeah again there's uh, there's not roller derby's not round here either is it so I'm guessing you had to travel for that and um there is there is a um 
I don't know whether it's like a roller disco or there is something I've been told about on the outskirts of York. And Manor School, is they that, do, that they do one. It? Yeah, they, they, yeah there's a few, but, but Manor School do roller disco. I'd it's go great. if I could it's do good, it. It's, it's just good hard. hard. It's just hard. Uh, we'll, go, it? we'll go one time, Sam. I'll tell, I'll tell you. We'll go around roller disco. <laughs> we'll skate what around. So they teach me what to do, then yeah. I will give it a go. It's good fun. It's good fun. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah, it's, it's. I mean, there's not loads of people that do it as a sport. So it's kind of. Uh, yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit hard to find teams, but there is a team in York. Yeah. Um. So, so did that come into your life at the same sort of time? Then she, you, you were you, sorry that you were injured, weren't you? And so it stopped you playing, um, g- going out on your skates. It stopped you. You'd stopped doing the qualification. You were off work at this time as well. Were you? So that must have been a really rough time for you. Yeah, I mean, it was. It, it wasn't the easiest time, but it certainly wasn't one of the roughest times it was just you know well n- not not the fact that i was off with a broken ankle yeah. i think it was everything that led up to that yeah. that, that I'd, I'd found difficult and that yeah. and that was hard um you know and i i think i'd got to a point after all of those things happened that you know i i was starting to have thoughts of suicide again and and i mean there's quite a common thought for me and and so i i'm not it's not i'm not saying that it's like oh it's oh i can just deal with it it's fine it's not a problem because it's it's, you know it's really difficult to have those thoughts but when um when they when they're thoughts i can acknowledge them as just thoughts uh it's when it's when things feel like they're taking a step further than that and i start thinking about acting on those thoughts yeah that's when I really know that I need to reach out and help. And that, and that's scary to be honest. Um, and that's, that's the bit that I've got a lot better at over the years. And, you know, just acknowledging that that's happening for me and it's, it's really difficult and it's really challenging. But if I can talk to somebody and I can say that out loud and, and I would, I would kind of, you know, maybe, be lucky enough to have people in my life who would I would f- trust to say in something to them and they would have the you know the ability to to listen and, and help me then yeah. then I might you know confide in in some people but if not then I'd, I'd kind of phone the Samaritans right. and um, have a conversation with with someone there which I you know I've done a few times and it's it's something that just allows you to kind of get it off your mind um but it can be quite all consuming you know when you're feeling like that it's really difficult to to kind of get out of that and yeah. find a way through it but it can be done and a lot of people do do it um it's just it's really hard trying to do it on your own i can imagine well i, c- I can't imagine but i'm so glad that you 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 will and then and so the Samaritans is twenty four hour um, number that you can call at any time, and you can just share confidentially with the person at the other end. Yeah, counsellors at the other end. Not counsellors; they're, they're volunteers. Um, you know, they they go through a lot of training to to become a Samaritans volunteer, um, and they um, they will they will just you know listen um, and be you know someone on the end of the phone yeah. that that can can just you know allow you to talk um and you know i think samaritans it's it's a free number it's um i think it's one one six one one six i haven't actually phoned them for for a long time digits isn't it but Uh, yeah it's it's a free phone number i was just checking on my phone to see if i can find (laughs) find the number because i couldn't remember it but you know they they also i think have have tried to not rebrand a bit but just i think just to be available to people who um have mental health problems and may not be you know f- feeling like at this moment i w- i want to kill myself yeah but but they may be aware that they're they're, they're encountering problems and yeah. so that they you know you, you you don't have to be at the point of you know a, an attempt of suicide at that very moment to phone them you can call them yeah. before that and you know that kind of earlier ask for help is yeah. really important because you know you've got them more chance to 
to kind of deal with it and rather than leaving it almost to the very last minute and having Absolutely. it as a last chance. Of course. Sorry, I was a bit distracted because no, no, I was okay. just checking Please about the, this, uh, this yeah, Samaritan right. number. So I think it's 116123. That sounds like the one. Yeah, yeah one, that, two, three is in the there. One. Yeah, that's really good. Um, yeah, I mean, you mentioned so that, that during this time you, you were having those feelings, but you'd felt them previously, earlier in life. Um, h- how much earlier in life? How How many years has this been a reality for you if you don't mind me asking no it's fine i mean i think i i'd I'd had thoughts at points going back to when i was a teenager really um and i it yeah it just feels like something that was kind of it's been there as a as a kind of a thought for a lot a big part of my life that doesn't mean that that it always progresses to me you know planning to act on it because that's like i say that that's the the stage at which i get you know really worried and i and i've you know got better at being able to to kind of seek help and to to kind of find ways around that and out of it but yeah it's been it's been something that's that's kind of been a part of my life yeah um i don't think i've ever really verbalized it to to, to people you know it, it was it was just you know you you're not quite sure what people might think so you might tentatively say something and then judge what their yeah. reaction is and and then and then maybe just not feel able to share it because it's a big thing to say out loud Coffee to somebody is. and you know i remember i think you know the the, the first time i said it to to somebody it was um you know it was quite a big a big thing and a big realization and and i was so worried that you know the response might be oh don't be daft or yeah oh oh ev- well everyone thinks like that don't you know what Trivializing you're not, you're not going to do it and and you know what 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 why are your attention seeking or you know all of those thoughts that yeah. that would go through your mind to to persuade you not to say anything yeah um i mean society does that doesn't it is that it kind of the responses that i think i've seen on tv or heard people say are things like don't tell me you're going to do something stupid uh you know that kind of trivializing and all it really is is kind of showing how much they don't want to believe that it's real for you um it feels like it's to them it won't seem like they're trivializing it but in doing so, it kind of just says, I don't want to know the, your reality because I've already decided that it's too much for me to handle. Um, do you know what I mean? That's how I feel when people say that. I don't think that it ne- necessarily is them trivialising it. It's it's them just not being able to handle it sort of thing. Yeah, I think you're kind of spot on with that, Sam, to be honest, because I, I, I think, yeah, I don't think people would be necessarily aware that that's what they're doing. And it's a difficult conversation. Yeah. And I think I have to be aware of of that when you know I talk to people and I think I've got um it's quite familiar to me and it's easy to forget that it's not familiar to other people yeah and you know realizing that you know (laughs) there might be whatever else going on for that other person that that I just haven't got a clue about it's it's really it's a sensitive conversation um that you know requires a bit of kind of emotional intelligence and awareness and, yeah. and sensitivity both ways really. Yeah. But that's a really difficult thing to do if is. you're in the depths of depression, yeah. uh, you know, anxiety, you know, that, that, that's, that's it for me yeah. is, is, is kind of depression and anxiety. Um, and, and, and if I'm like that, it's very, very difficult to see outside of that fog of depression yeah. and see from somebody else's perspective. Cause it's quite, all consuming and and i think you know and i I, it's definitely been something that's absolutely ruined like friendships relationships um you know it's something that's led to me self-isolating or being isolated from people um either because you know i've maybe asked too much of people for support or people haven't felt able to to be supportive or i haven't felt able to like be you know open enough because i was too worried about what what somebody might say but i think that's that's the that's the saddest thing for me is the the number of of 
you know people that I've met through my life and and you know friendships that maybe have ended or you know that that I haven't been able to continue because I've had to like withdraw that you know the my way of coping is to withdraw and stop yeah. you know doing things and it's very hard to know that anyone cares if they don't reach out and make an effort yeah. um and you know and i mean life is like a lot of people coming and going coming into your life and going yeah. out of your life and 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 that's that's kind of normal but it does um i do i do reflect on that sometimes about you know the number of people that you know i've I've had contact with and I've kind of really, you know, enjoyed spending time with. I've kind of, you know, they're, they're friends. I've, you know, loved them and then they're, they're just not there anymore. And it's yeah. quite, it just, it just kind of makes me feel lonely because I, I do quite, I do lead quite a lonely life, to be honest. I mean, I live on my own. Um, I'm, I'm a, I'm a crazy cat woman, I suppose <laughs> is what you'd say. So I've got a couple of, a couple of cats. Oh, but what, what calls, what names? Uh, well, they're they're named after Thundercats characters. If <laughs> yes. if anyone of a certain age yes. would <laughs> might remember that. Not not the not the remake. I'm talking about the <laughs> the old school, the original. Um, what was it? A, a, a late eighties, nineties yeah, cartoon. Yeah. I, was, I grew up with that. Yeah, yeah. So did I. <laughs> Amazing. Um, but yeah, so uh, they're, they're named after those characters. Um, and uh, yeah, and I and I work from home. Um, and I don't really, I don't really kind of socialize much anymore um and i've i yeah i i I think since since covid um a lot of the the things that i used to do as kind of hobbies and you know social contacts all sort of stops during covid and i haven't kind of picked those back up i think i'm still i think i'm still kind of impacted by yeah. what's happened in covid and that was i mean that was a busy time for me because working in public health was was kind of full on during yeah. covid because yeah. that's you know what 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 we were doing in in public health um and um yeah i think it's it's something that still affected me and i think i i've noticing it a lot more recently that i've just i'm i'm quite isolated you know i'm not having contact with people i'm not doing much i mean i go to the gym I don't go as much as I should, but I do, I do go, um, even if I just go and have a swim and then sit in the sauna. Yeah, that rather physical than, movement. And, you know, and r- rather than go into it's the so important, gym and try and lift weights, which yeah. I'm rubbish at. <laughs> yeah, I've never done it. I've I've never done it. Gyms are a strange, scary place for me. Yeah, and me. <laughs> I, 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 they, they really are. And like when, when I'm feeling um, a bit anxious anyway and a bit self-conscious, it's really not a pleasant feeling to go to the gym yeah. and see all these like really fit, <laughs> attractive yeah. people yeah. just like doing things so easily. And I just think, oh, okay, I just, I, I'm just this old, slightly chubby, bald <laughs> guy <laughs> just puffing away, <laughs> trying to lift a minimal amount really, of weight. Honestly, I think that's a more common feeling than than people realise. I mean, we've started this thing called the Safe Space Project where we're trying to because guys are telling us you know they they lack exercise they're missing out on how important that bit of of their life really is because it can make you f- it can help you cope can it if you've had a really good workout and you feel good about yourself and you you know you you f- you're hitting fitness goals you can it can help with other bits of your life but the idea of walking into a gym for the first time and being like right who do i talk to which bit do i use what's the you know how do I not look like a complete idiot? And for me, like super puny little, you know, kind of, I just wouldn't know where to start. And actually, so... I, I saw you do a pull-up earlier. I've got a pull-up bar, but in the, in the comfort of my own home, I don't mind that I could only do one and you a half one. pull-ups. You did one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and a half. Um, but the, <laughs> the, um, the, 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 the project, the idea of the project is um, connect with gyms ensure that their ethos is similar to ours and that they realize that there's blokes out there who will find it anxiety inducing and uh kind of um there's just something quite macho even if it's not real and which often it's not i know you know quite a few um regular gym goers and they're some of the nicest people ever it's not that it's um it's not that it's necessarily rooted in reality it's just that the idea of walking to somewhere surrounded by loads of people you don't know and be expected to get your body out and start doing something that you've never done before is scary. And so introductory sessions, we've got um, Legion's gym do this kickboxing session after they've shut 
So it's only between like 9 p.m. You can go and hit some bags and kind of speak to this this um, Al who runs it, who's just really, he's a counsellor himself. He's trained as a counsellor, so he can bring that sort of caring experience. And once you're in there and you've done a bit yourself, maybe you'll feel a little more, more confident in going in. And so we're trying to roll that out at the moment because you, you it's right, isn't it? I mean, it's not going to solve the problems that you've got going on during day-to-day -day life but it's like kind of like the counseling it's it's a little bit of you time that maybe helps you cope with all the hours in between the next time that you go um yeah and i mean exercise is is really important i mean it's it's one of the the the, the five ways to well-being you know keeping active it's it's a really positive benefit yeah. for you both physically and mentally you know it's it, exercise is it, 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 you know it really is one of the things that can be very helpful when you know when you're struggling with your mental health or i mean i can only speak for me but when i'm struggling with my mental health you know and i'm feeling depressed i'm feeling you know in a dip and i'm feeling low you know i, I i've 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 been in a position before where you know i i i couldn't you I couldn't really leave the house you know right. because it's just too much yeah and then the prospect of going to the gym when you like that it's it's just it feels unachievable yeah. but even doing small things like going for a walk you know you don't have to start with going to the gym it's kind of like um i was thinking sometimes about going to the gym like if i've been if i haven't exercised for a while i think okay what worries me most about going back to the gym is other people seeing me being unfit yeah so it's almost like i want i need to get fit in order to go to There's the a gym. base level to get yeah. yeah it's like it's like if someone's coming around your house um, I mean, I've never had a cleaner, but I've heard people say, oh, well, if I had a cleaner, I, I'd clean up my house before they come because I don't want to see, <laughs> yeah. I don't want them to see my house yeah. messy. And Can't. it's kind of like that with the gym. It's like, I've got to get fit to go to the to gym, go to the gym yeah. but, but you can't get fit unless you go to the gym. Yeah. So, so what do you do? You go around in a circle of going, yeah. oh, I can't go. Well, I just run on my own. At six a.m. Oh, when it's dark, nobody can see. It. That's a good. I'm just I'm rubbish at running though, so I can't, I can't, I can't get the breathing right. I don't know. It sounds silly, but I can't. I, I just don't know how to breathe when I run. I, and if, if I start thinking about it, I like, is you, <laughs> I get I get confused. I'm like, oh, am I meant to breathe in or out right yeah. now? And well, it, I, I had all of that, and I, I it, the couch to five k helps me because it. I think I thought I could run. For me, it was a little bit more that my breathing was probably okay, but the rest of my body was like, you know, I, I, I was aching everywhere, and I was trying to. I was like, I can do this, I can do this, and then I'd have, I'd be like injured for a few days. I'd sprain my, my, uh, the bottom of my foot and stuff like that. And it, I think you just sometimes go faster than you probably should. It should be a more gradual thing, a bit like yeah. the gym. It shouldn't be, you know, start pulling all your muscles straight away. Just you, you've got to work up to it. Um, yeah. But I, I. I would have said i'll never be a runner i literally at one point was no way and I, I tried the couch to 5k three times before it it set and i think a lot of these things are, it's routine isn't it rather than expecting it to sort of happen at once or um that the progress follows the motivation to actually go out and it's really hard to have the motivation to go out before you've made any progress so it's yeah it's a, it, yeah and at that beginning point it feels like a, a catch-22 and yeah. you've really just got to plow through it i think yeah I mean, I've, I've, I, I mean, I'd, I like, I've done the park run a few times um, and I, I quite like that because you're running with other people. Yeah. So you don't feel so self-conscious, but you're not like running at their pace. You can do it on your own. Yeah. And that's quite good. But, you know, I, I, I don't really enjoy running, like going out for a jog. No. I, I, I much prefer swimming. I like, I like, I like swimming. I, I, I know how to breathe when you swim because you can only breathe <laughs> when in, in the air. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, so that helps me. Yeah. Whereas yeah. running, you, you've got all the options to breathe. Yeah, and yeah. I'm like, when do I breathe? <laughs> I'd, yeah. I've got to the point now where I, I've, I can put a podcast or music in and I can forget. It's like a bit of a, a um, meditation probably the closest my brain gets to a meditative state now because it just feels like i can go oh my god i've just done a couple of k without even thinking because i'm i'm in my head my headphones you know i mean i do hear people saying I, to run with no headphones no music no phone no watch just run like i think that, that the concept scares me a bit of just being just in my like own Forrest head Gump. yeah yeah just no that's not for me um <laughs> But no, I, I, I'm I'm glad you're doing that. And I, I think everybody's got a fitness journey. I think everybody should have a fitness journey. It's just sometimes the 
that the step into the first bit seems too big, whether it's into the gym, whether it's I don't run or I can't do that or I'm not flexible or whatever it is. You know, my mum, she wouldn't mind me saying she has MS and she she started doing Pilates and she loves it. And it's like, oh, I, I, the people are all really nice. And, you know, even though there's a bit of a stigma and I know that she sometimes struggles with that a little bit, um, everyone's really accommodating and, and really kind and friendly and non-judgmental. And actually she's made made friends there and it helps with her MS. And it's like, we, we all need it yeah. um, no, in some way. I've never tried Pilates. I, I, I Yoga, I've, I, I like yoga. Yeah, I haven't I haven't done yoga for 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 a few years, but I've got a, a friend who's who, who's just qualifying as a as a yoga instructor and and loving it. And um, you know, I'm thinking, oh, well, maybe I should, you know, when he sets up his classes, it's it's not he's not local, so he's a bit far yeah. away. But I think, well, maybe I'll I'll go down and yeah. see see what he's like as a yeah, yogi. Yeah. Well, I think that sort of thing helps with all the other fitness as well, doesn't it? I think whatever else you might be doing. If you're more flexible and, and, and stronger in your car, then um, everything else gets easier. So I, I definitely want to start. I've just started doing that. Um, she's got a mat out now, actually. She's probably doing it in there as we speak. But she, You know, you can do that in front of the YouTube, can't you? You don't need to necessarily put yourself out there for that sort of exercise. You don't. I, I Yeah, I couldn't quite get into the habit of, of doing it at home and, and doing the YouTube video. I, I I think the classes are better for me. Yeah. And once you get into a routine, you find one you like and, yeah. you you know, you can go to it regularly. It's, it, you know... It's a community spirit there. Yeah, well. and, and you can get used to it. As long as, as long as you're right, right, risking, you know, having a fart when you do some... <laughs> um, oh, I'd some never poses. go back. <laughs> I'd just shuffle out of the room and just very quietly. hop on a plane and just have done with it. Yeah. Delete all my social media accounts. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean... <laughs> Yeah, luckily I've never have, obviously. Um, <laughs> um, tell me a little bit about the five ways to well-being. You mentioned it briefly there. We've got exercise as one of those. Oh, yeah, you're going to put me on the spot now. I've got to try and remember them all. <laughs> Come on, Nick, um, you're well qualified for this one. <laughs> well, sort of. Um, so uh, connecting with people is another one. Um, staying active, learning, uh, giving, and um, what is the fifth one? Something to do with nature, I think. Oh, yeah, which is really important. And I guess as well, you can't, for me, that kind of comes in with my running. Mm. I think I feel like I wouldn't want to run on a treadmill. There's something about being out there. I, I don't run in the rain. I do have limits, but even if it's really cold or dark, like I do like being out there, actually feeling it. Um, so I think, yeah, and I, I, connecting um, with people massively important especially like you say over covid where people's opportunities for that have been kind of squashed and for me now like you know all of our team meetings are over zoom and and uh, well teams now um and largely you can do the the work over there People have, you know, the manager speaks, you tell, you feedback, the next person talks. But when it comes to like social interactions, I just never quite felt right about it. Everyone was doing sort of house party and um, and what else was there? There was like just people were meeting up on apps on a Friday night to like chill out and talk. And I always just felt there was a bit of a disconnect. See, I, I, I never I never really had any of that during COVID. I was, I, I, I just, I'd, I'd, I was really disconnected from everybody yeah. and everything because I'd I'd um I'd realized that social media stuff for me was actually more damaging than right. good so I I'd kind of gone off social media I think a, you know a, a year or a couple of years before that so stopped right. using Facebook stopped using you know all the any social media accounts because it's just it's all superficial I think do you still are you still not I don't, I don't no I don't I don't use it at all I don't like it I think Facebook is the devil um, I'm this, it, you're probably one of the first people I was going to say I've ever met but that's a bold statement you're the first pe person that I think I've ever spoken to about it that said that they don't have any social media accounts that's really interesting I, I and, hate and it. this was well before Covid as well yeah it's just um, it, it's just something I mean it, it connects you I, it's, it you know there are benefits to it and i know a lot of people get you know a lot from it but i i used to find you can i you get dragged into it and it becomes quite um 
quite a superficial way to interact with people. Yeah. It didn't make me feel more connected to people. It made me more aware of things that other people were doing. Yeah. But it felt it felt like things were, you know, quite competitive. It felt it it it's the way I thought about it was that it's it's kind of designed to 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 kind of get you interested in going back you know the purpose of it is to stay on it and yeah and one of the things that works well to do that is kind of creating a bit of a sense of anxiety and and kind of thinking okay i need to go back i need to check i I need to yeah Yeah. what am i missing yeah the the, the fear of missing out what's that fomo FOMO. and and that and and i've got that massively and i think oh god i don't want to miss out on anything i don't want to be the the one person that you know doesn't get invited to a thing or you know doesn't get that joke or I totally you know, and whatever know. and and yeah. i just i just thought you know what this is not healthy for me and i just need to just step back from it and and honestly i'm a lot happier having come off Cut that it out I, I it does again I mean, again it makes me sad because I've, I've lost contact with so many people yeah. because i've done that but also you know you know lots of people had my contact number and yeah. nobody made any effort to to contact yeah. me outside of that so i just think okay well it was only you know facebook stuff yeah i i mean i through the start of covid i felt like there was a window of opportunity and i, I came off all the socials and i even tried my best to come off my phone altogether i had a work phone for work um and i think in the end i deleted the apps turned off all my notifications, but left my phone on. But I thought it was going to be really high. I expected, like, withdrawal of some kind. Not because I was using it to the excess, but just like that FOMO, that kind of, I'll just check out, you know, like it would be somehow overwhelming. But I think with setting a boundary of none was much easier than I expected it to be. And also quite um, relieving. There was definitely a weight weight off. Um I mean, at the time, I'd been prior to that, I'd been spending quite a few because I'd, I'd started Pop Up York, a little side project. I'd felt like, oh, I need to stay in people's, I need to stay relevant, I need to stay in people's minds. So I was th- feeling like I had to find reasons to post and content to post regularly, and uh, which was nonsense. And you know, since going back to um, socials, I feel like I've got a slightly better relationship with them. Um, but when I've been at my least happy for whatever reason or my most anxious they've been the worst place to be because it's like well uh, people posting pictures of of doing something that i wasn't there why didn't they ask me Uh, did they not care about me anymore or 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 yeah or kind of um posting something that wasn't strictly true because i felt like i needed to you know tell people that i was alive and, and kicking and okay um and that you know that it is nonsense, and I, I, am, I have tried since coming back after COVID to be really honest. I mean, it is sometimes it's pictures of Luna or updates, uh, mentalness stuff, but sometimes it's this is shit right now, or this is what I'm doing to try and resolve feeling shit, or it just, you know, I think we've got to be honest along with the, if it's all just everything's so great, look at my brilliant life, then it's it's not accurate is it no it's not well i mean it might be at that time for somebody but i can't Do i don't think, think i don't think well it might in that moment maybe but I I can't, see, yeah. what i'm saying is i don't think it's sustainable yes for that you know we yeah, we, yeah. we we have a range of emotions we can't yeah. strive to just feel happiness all the time that's just not possible yeah. it just it does not work like that and if you try and ignore any other emotions just so that you feel happy all the time i think you will that will come back and bite you at some point yeah. later because where are all those other emotions going yeah. you're pushing them down well somewhere. i think that's and i think that was the cause of most of my anxiety was that i was so good at pretending that i was absolutely fine all the time that everyone thought oh it's sam yeah you know sam's always in a good mood and and you kind of get that feedback and then because you get that feedback well i better stay this is what people expect from me yeah. and then you kind of realize that that is not sustainable and that when something comes along that kicks you kicks your ass and you're like I don't know how to not be me. I remember thinking, I'm going to be like Fun Bob from Friends, you know, that kind of, (laughs) Fun Bob's coming, yay! And then Fun Bob gets there and he's not Fun Bob anymore. It's because he stopped drinking. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, and that's, you know, that's that's a thing for me, you know, drinking uh, is definitely a bit of a um, crutch in in that if I have a few uh, early on, 
I'll be in a great mood rather than up in my head thinking that I don't want to be here or I've said yes to something but I feel like I had to go because because I've said I'll go and I don't want to let people down because they'll they'll mm. realize you know they'll realize that they don't like me very much whatever it might be it's catastrophizing it's filling in people's blanks and it's yeah. it's assuming that that people have got you know and it, it, there's a guilt around it too because people don't think like that people are too busy with their own stuff to be thinking that much about me but I know that doesn't matter even knowing it isn't enough to stop it when you're in that negative mindset um and so i wonder if social media is kind of an extension of that of kind of why nobody talks about it in real life again because they're putting on their they're putting on their avatar the smiley avatar and saying everything's great over here what about you yeah i'm good you you know it's just it's yeah. not the whole picture but the whole picture doesn't detract you know, I, I'm. I feel like if someone tells me I've got some real shit going on right now, and they confide in me, and I tell them, "Yeah, me too," that's just much more like uh, validating, and it, it brings me closer to that person so much quicker, and the, it's so much more interesting to hear what p- people have got going on, and how it overlaps with my experience. I don't. I, I don't understand why people wouldn't rather have those conversations. Yeah, I I I totally get what you're saying. I I think. I mean, I, I guess I can understand why people don't want to have those conversations because they're not always easy no. and they, they don't get, you know, they don't make you feel good or happy or validated always, you know, they, 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 they can be, you know, difficult and, yeah. um, you know, y- y- it's, you know, <laughs> people want to feel happy, people want to feel good and, and, and I think, you know, if if they get that from social media posts then i guess that that's what draws you know people back and and i suppose i think the one thing i noticed was i think i was trying to put things on there because i wanted to you know put put across a certain light or i was trying to think of oh i've got to put 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 something on there and i've got to try and make it seem you know like it's positive and like it's great and and isn't this yeah. you know good and i think you know i just wanted people to yeah. respond positively to it rather than you know being able to be honest but then when you try and be honest on on the facebook thing it's like it it, 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 it it's a downer for other people because they don't want to see it and it's it's also not it's not really you know, it, it, it's not an interaction. It's it's something goes on there. People press a like button or a react yeah. button, and it doesn't actually lead to any interaction. I uh, so it never felt to me like it was a an actual real connection. No, there's sort of an emptiness to to someone yeah. bearing their soul, and then a like or a sad face. So they've not even typed anything. They've just clicked something, and 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 yeah, I I, I get that, and also everything that comes with the kind of dopamine hit you get the tiny little bit of dopamine you get from your like or your notification that that draws you back chemically to this to staring at your your black mirror you yeah. know it's no i absolutely and I, and I just i just can't i i i can't associate the social media with with positive feelings no. um it, it, it's so and so I, for me i just i just choose not to use it at all I and, I, and i'm really happier doing that and i but I, i'm i've got I'm, I'm i'm much more of a, a kind of an all or nothing person yeah. i can't I, I, I wouldn't be able to go on it and use it in moderation yeah because i think i get sucked into the to the model behind it and i and yeah. i would i would get sucked in again i mean that's that's partly why i, d- I just don't drink anymore and, right. I, and i haven't done for years now because you know i i realized that I was drinking too much at points when, you know, I wasn't in a good place. And even when I tried to like moderate it, it very easily then creeps back up. Yeah. And so I thought, you know what, I just, I'm just going to stop drinking. And it took me a while because that was, that was hard. When was that? Oh, I'm not sure because I mean, I should, (laughs) I should keep a track of it and count how many years and stuff it was. Cause I, 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 I went to AA and, 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 um, I, I kind of, used that as a support tool for a few years and then i think i got what i needed from it yeah and and i don't i don't use it in the way that some people would why you know maybe going back to a meeting once a week or you know every few days or whatever you know for the rest of their lives i I think i just kind of got to a point where i was like okay i've i've broken the habit with it i 
feel like I can manage not drinking and and I have you know and and I just feel better for not doing that um and I I I, you know and I I mean, oh God. and I, you know, I've given up smoking as well. I mean, that was that was hard too. And yeah. every now and then, I get a little craving for for yeah. for both of them. And then I just think, well, yeah, why? None, of, neither of those things do you any good. What's yeah. what's the point of it? So, ha- so how do you know roughly how long ago it was? Then um, it's probably about ten years, maybe. Whoa, something like that. Nine, eight, nine, ten no years. Way, something man. like that. That's amazing. Congratulations! That's because it's a big, it's a big deal. The fact that you 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 felt like you needed to go to AA about it means that it was a a part of your life that um you know you needed to take control of. And it, it sounds like you're when you set yourself a target, a goal, you you achieve it. Um, that's you. Same with the you know with the um the study, um and same with the social media. You know if it's good for you, then you you chase you, you get it you know i think i just yeah i i i i, it, I, I don't see this is, see it's interesting i like talking to you sam because you make me you make me look at myself differently because my self opinion is not good uh, right. uh but 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 you've just pointed out something that actually sounds quite good and i'm thinking oh okay that's maybe i've done a good thing but it's, it's written all over you nick genuinely it's it, you know it, it, the fact that you don't see it is um it baffles me you know, um, I mean, let, before we move on from the drinking, just it's worth saying that York currently has a, a campaign on around um, alcohol that you lower my drinking dot com. Um, they've got a, a, a quiz, which is really quite interesting. It just talks about, you know, your consumption and what levels they are and how that compares to the rest of the population, which is really interesting. Um, and, and, you know, that York's lucky enough to offer support to people at whatever level they're drinking. Um, you know, to reduce it. Whereas some places, they'll support you if you're um, alcohol dependent um, or, or sort of in crisis around alcohol. Whereas in York, even if you just think I've got an issue here, uh, like as you say, maybe I'd like to cut down, but you realise quite quickly that you can't. Um, get on the council's website, york.gov.uk, um, or search lowermydrinking.com dot um, because I, I, it's an important conversation, and I appreciate you telling us about it because we we it comes up in our whatsapp group it comes up in some of our um talk groups everyone's got a different relationship with alcohol you know some use it um binge it in a weekend and then regret you know some of that regret that you feel afterwards some use it as a sort of numbing agent to kind of get through whatever they're going through people like me who maybe it's it's a bit of a dutch courage before a night out but the idea of not having that is kind of a scary feeling um so there's you know we're all on a different journey with it but i think that not shaming people about it um and also listening to people who've who've kicked it and and you know continue without it in their lives um fine for a decade nearly you know that's that's really important so um thank you for telling us about that and thank you for telling us about all of it like you know just what you've been through um to the strength that it must take to kind of face that on a on a regular basis and still show up and still qualify in, in a field that involves helping others. We've not even talked about counselling yet and we're already at 1 hour 34. Oh, really? Um, <laughs> t- talk to me a little bit about, about your counselling because we, we, it's one bit we haven't touched on yet and I, it's important to us because we, you know, we refer men for counselling. We, we, we no, want to normalise it. Um, so, and, and, and you are a humanistic counsellor, is that right? Is that correct? Uh, yeah, so um, yeah, I'm, well, I'm glad you, glad you prompted me to talk about that because it was one of the things I wanted <laughs> to to talk about. So um, yeah, the the counselling um, I do in York is um, for uh, a charity which is called One to One Counselling. It's the the numbers, so the number one, number two, number one counselling. Um, so it's one to one counselling dot co dot uk. And it's a free or pay as you can afford um, counselling service, so uh, it's set up to mean it's accessible for anybody. Um, the services um, run from a couple of locations. Can offer some evening appointments, offer daytime appointments, um, and at the moment I'm only counselling uh, there as a volunteer. Um, just seeing, I think three well yeah one evening a week three three clients um and then at some point in the future 
um, I might um, kind of pick up some private practice and and kind of build that into my work week as well. But it's the thing that I get a lot of um, satisfaction from in yeah. kind of helping uh, people who come to see me um, work through some of the problems and you know feel that they've got a safe space to talk about the things that are troubling them with also not having to worry about paying, you yeah. know, if, you know, if somebody's struggling financially or, you know, they're, they're just on low income, then, you know, it's still accessible. Big barrier just removed. It is a big barrier. And, you know, it's, it's not, it's not cheap to, to go through counseling, but, you know, it's also the, you know, it's a, it's a thing that can be an investment for somebody, yeah. you know, it's, it, it, it's kind of essentially the same as spending money on going to the gym. It's just yeah. spending money on your going mind. to the gym for your mind. Yeah. Really. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I do that and, um, yeah, really get a lot out of it. Um, and you know, there are sort of 15 other, I think the number keeps changing, you know, 15 other, um, counselors who give their time, um, for free as well. Um, and the service is uh, funded through grants uh, or donations and um, has been kind of running for, I think, probably about 20 years. Right. Um, and it was I can set up by um, a guy called Alan who um, used to be one of the lecturers at York St. John's running the counselling course. Right. Um, I think he'd, he'd left as a lecturer before I did my course there. Um, but I did my... Um, placement training uh there um because obviously you need to uh accrue uh, a number hours. of hours yeah. to, 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 to as part of the qualification and um yeah just really enjoyed working for it as an organization and decided i was just gonna you know stay on once qualified and just you know do Donate that do that on a basically. volunteer basis yeah yeah that's amazing is it so is it it's still local and it's still york based still york based yeah so is it face to face or are you online um it's it's both so during covid there was you know the uh, telephone counseling offer or some video counseling officer uh, offers so some of the counselors still offer telephone support um but it's face to face again now that's um good. and it works from I can never remember the name of the building because I don't work in there during the day. But there's, um, you know, where the old Mecca Bingo was, the one they've just knocked down. Yeah, Fishergate. Um, Fishergate, yeah. that's it. I can never remember the name. There's, um, oh, and I can't remember the name of the building, but there's a building sort of opposite that, which is like an, uh, an old school. Yes, um, I know what you mean. Yeah, can you remember opposite. what it's called? Is it not called the old school or something? It's It's right next to a school. Right. But um, it might be the old. I don't know. Um, okay. Well, well, I'll put it in the description. Yeah. Afterwards. I'm. Go uh, yeah, because that's going to. And, and uh, Alan's going to tell me off now that I couldn't <laughs> remember the name of the building. But I, I, I work out of the um, the Quaker Meeting House in uh, Centre of Town. Oh yeah, Friargate is it? Uh, that that one's Friargate, I think. Yeah, I get confused nice with York there. still with all yeah. the, the the gates. I've done quite a few um, training courses down there. It's down like a little side street off Clarence Street. Uh. Yeah, I think so. I just not you know, this is not in Clarence, I mean Clifford Street. Clifford Street, yes, definitely. <laughs> I was thinking that's not quite right. But I've been in York what nearly fifteen years now, and I <laughs> yeah. still can't remember the name of the street. It's not like the gate. Um, so, so can tell me then. So you've been counselling and doing this um, voluntarily. Um, can you counsel yourself? That's a you know a question that seems to kind of. As a coach, I know I can coach myself. It doesn't always work. I know I can coach other people with their with what they're going through, and I I I can ask myself the same questions and find I, I really struggle to motivate myself or stop procrastinating or get past the perfectionism, you know. And I, I wonder whether or not counselling is the same. You know, do you find yourself asking yourself the same sort of questions you might ask a client? I don't. I mean, my other people might be more successful at it, but I don't. I don't think I do particularly well. I don't think it's possible for me for me to do that. I mean, I. I so, as a counsellor, you have to have regular supervision with yeah. with somebody and talk about the clients that you're supporting and kind of make sure that you're kind of offering them the be best quite support heavy as well, isn't it? Taking on people's stuff. Um. It, Are you able to sort of disconnect from? 
I don't think it's I don't think it's so much as disconnecting. I think the it, the, the boundaries are important and realizing what you know what your role is, is as a counselor because my role isn't to take on responsibility for somebody else's no. you know needs or problems. Um and I think once you realize that you know you you have no control over somebody else. Yeah. And that it's not your responsibility in any way how somebody else feels um and acts you can you know you you can have that without losing the the ability the ability to empathize yeah and and and, you know but but that's a a really important distinction because if you if you feel responsible for somebody else then then it becomes stressful yeah but you know if if you're able to separate that out then yeah. I think it becomes manageable. And then, you know, being able to kind of talk at supervision sessions about, you know, the things that are coming up in those sessions and your approach to them and just getting confirmation that, that you know, that's that's effective or, you know, have you tried this? Have you tried exploring this? You know, have you, you know, it sounds like this person might be, you know, really struggling with, you know, these kind of feelings or, um, you know, how do you how can you adapt your approach to to try and you know get something more out of the client yeah. so that you know they can they can kind of move forward yeah. um but yeah it's it's not and that whole process i don't think um you can do that on yourself but but my certainly my mental health has gradually improved over the years because i've got more involvement in you know supporting other people with mental health yeah that's really good um so i feel more able i feel like i've got more skills and tools to to kind of keep myself in a much better place that's really good that's really good um yeah and helping others seeing other people make meaningful change in their situations and lives and that must it's quite a privileged position to be in i bet that's quite rewarding for you is it yeah, it's it's really rewarding, and like, you know, just hearing, seeing the change in somebody from when they come through the door in the week one, and you know, explain what's brought them there, and then working through that and seeing how that's changed for the person, and their outlooks changed, and their view on it has changed, and they're able to express that and say, you know, thanks, that's been really helpful. Yeah. You know that that yeah, it's massive actually. And I've had some you know lovely cards from from people who've written some you know really lovely things and just you know expressed their thanks. And I'm I, you know I'm really grateful for that. But also you know, it's it's them that have done the work and them that have done made the change. It's just I, I've given them the space and the time. There's to a blockage explore. sometimes, isn't there? And and it's really helpful to have somebody that you've mentioned it before a different perspective somebody who can just m- maybe shine a light on where that blockage is so that you can remove it yourself. Yeah. Um, and, and that's that's a, an amazing thing, mate. Can, can I ask, what is then humanistic counselling in how does that differentiate to other types of counselling, would you say? So um, it's, I, I mean, one of the, the key thing for um, counselling is uh, any kind of therapeutic um process is is really the the relationship the right. rapport between the counselor and and the yeah. person being counseled i i'm there as a counselor to support somebody from their own frame of reference and to kind of talk about what they want to talk about in the sessions because yeah. people will come to counseling and they might say oh, I, I i'm not sure why i'm here but once they start talking about things then you know it th- they they start to realize why they're here and and I think really for me that's kind of the biggest thing about a humanistic approach is is following what it means for that person and not um not kind of leading them to talk about something specific or trying to diagnose them necessarily but responding to what it is that they're saying and giving them the time and the space to explore that offering them some different perspective some reflection back on what they've talking about and some challenges as well at times because you know sometimes you have to be challenged to move forward of course um so it's it's very much for me about creating that 
that's that safe space where somebody can can talk through what it is that they want to talk about and understand what it is that they want to get from the sessions and yeah. and that becomes quite apparent to people i think you know fairly early on in the sessions even if somebody hasn't had counseling before and the very first time they come they're quite nervous and daunted and don't I'll know say, what to tell expect tell me what to do i don't know what to yeah. do you know, expect you to kind of give them an answer do you get that quite a bit yeah i think so at the beginning you know people people maybe have a bit of an expectation that that they will be told how to fix themselves and you know that i suppose they are but not not directly and and it's not something that comes from me it's something that comes from the person yeah so you know that that they are exploring what their experience is like and yeah. where they want to see a change and how they can work through some difficult emotions or some difficult circumstances or you know you you can't necessarily change a situation always directly but you can change your perspective about it yeah. and i think and and i suppose for, for me one of the the key things for me personally in like my journey with mental health is acceptance rather than trying to fit what i wanted things to be like into what was happening at the time not quite yeah. matching so accepting the situation at the time accepting That's how i feel accepting that i'm not going to be you know happy all the time or i'm not going to be you know the person that somebody wants to be with or i'm not going to get that job or i'm not going to be successful at this you know and and accepting that's happened yeah and it's just part of life rather than than kind of trying to create a different sort of reality that makes you think that something's better or different than what it actually is yeah i don't know if that makes it, do, sense. it massively does um and i think it's a word that i keep coming back to acceptance because i think i spent a long time trying to be who i think i should be or who i think other people want me to be um and then i've spent quite a bit of time recognizing my anxiety and thinking i need to fix that 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 guy needs to go because that's uncomfortable and i don't like that and I, i've i've been fine for so long i need to get back to where i was and then when it comes back for whatever reason it's like not this again you know and it's it feels it, you're in that spiral again um and coaching has been a huge part of my life and i've it's really it's it's helped me to make the steps that i need to make despite maybe feeling like I'm an imposter sometimes, or like I'm not going to be able to achieve them, but it doesn't leave a lot of room for acceptance because it's it's lot it's lots around kind of awareness of a situation, goal setting, moving forward, progress, you know, and um, I think that's been a lot of my socials um, content too, is kind of productivity and, uh, and 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 that sort of thing. So acceptance, being able to kind of find a way to see things as they are as okay rather than always be looking to that next thing or that goal or that thing that will resolve the inner turmoil is quite if it sounds like a superpower i'll be honest um and i'm certainly no nowhere near finding it yet but i do keep coming back to that word and it does start to it's i start to think i need some more of that in my life um Oh, don't get me wrong. I'm I'm nowhere near achieving it all <laughs> yeah. the time. It, it, it's like you I have, help I have, others achieve. I it. have moments. <laughs> I have moments where I think, okay, I've got it, and then and then you know other moments where I think, actually, I've lost it again. I need to get yeah. it back. And you know, I, but that, but that's the thing. You know, it's, it's a practice. It, it's, rather than... it's practice, and it's perseverance. And life moves and changes, and you've got to try and be able to adapt to it. Um, and you know, you can't be on it every second of every minute of every hour of every day you yeah. know you, you will ebb and flow in terms of how your emotions are and how you feel able to cope but i think if you're always trying to go forward and always keep going keep persevering yeah never go up never surrender but progress is never linear rarely is it it's it's um you know there's going to be setbacks but as long as the overall path is in the right direction. Um, thank you so much for your time. I mean, we're pushing two hours now. This is a new record. 
um, that <laughs> fear. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I don't apologise. It's good stuff, man. Really, and and the um, you know you you you're so generous with your time. You're so honest with um, your experiences. Um, I can't wait f- till I can tell people how they can see the Y project. But in the meantime, you can go to the York Ending Stigma website, which I'll put in the description because I don't know off the top of my head unless you do. Um, the why suicide prevention campaign and you can look at um, any online events that might be coming up there was one today but i'm i'm i've no doubt there'll be more um and as soon as we know what's happening with that film we will let everybody know on our socials please please do check it out if you can um yeah just thank you so much um for the support you've given me for the support you give others um and for for being here like i know You've been through so much, mate, and uh, you, what you offer to the world is of so much value. Um, I'm always here. My door's open. We can do this. We don't even have to cod it. You can just come around for a chat if you want. Um, but it's been an absolute pleasure listening to you, mate. Um, so thank you. No, thanks, Sam. I really appreciate that, and it's it's great to have um, you know, had this time having a, having a nice chat with you. Um, I've kind of finally got used to having a microphone <laughs> yeah. in front of my mouth. Um, <laughs> But yeah, no, I really appreciate it. And thank you for your kind words. And it's really great to spend some time with you. And uh, yeah. Let's do it again soon. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. No worries. See you soon. Take care. Cheers, man.